So, lovely. Um, I'm preaching about Jesus. I'm not sure how much you heard of me before, but essentially I'm preaching about Jesus uh, from the Old Testament uh, today, and I will be preaching about Jesus from the Old Testament uh, for the foreseeable future um, until, uh, until there's no more stories left. So essentially this is a plan. We're going to go through uh, the big uh, pictures, the big stories of the Old Testament, and we're going to look at where Jesus is found in those stories and what we can learn about Jesus from the Old Testament. Because as you read through the Old Testament, essentially, um, the law, as in uh, what the, the Jews called the law, or the um, Pentateuch, or the Old Testament as a whole for some, for some Jewish people, essentially um, is a, it's a collection of promises, prophecies about the future Messiah to come. So we're going to be looking at those, we're going to be looking at what we uh, to expect of Jesus uh, as, we, uh, as we go through the Old Testament. So, with that all being said, um, I'm glad that so many of you could join us again. Hello, uh, Stuart, and hello, Charles, and April, and Harmony, and Phil again, and Jamie, and uh, everyone else who's watching. So why don't you uh, jump on and share this uh, feed uh, with your friends and family. And we're going to read from Genesis chapter 3. So, um, as I was um, briefly mentioning before, essentially... We're going to be looking at uh, the fall of man, we call it. This is when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit uh, of the tree, the forbidden tree. And essentially, um, what happens here is um, Adam and Eve basically are told, you mustn't eat from a particular tree in the garden. And then it says this. Um, it says that they ate of the tree. Um, and then what happens is, in verse 8, it says, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave me uh, to be with me, um, she, she gave me... Uh, the tree, uh, the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and the dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and she uh, and you, he will bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Okay, so there's me scripture. I hope you're all with us today. So, um, so we're going to look at a couple of bits in this. Uh, so basically, we're going to be talking about Adam and Eve this week and next week as well, uh, or the next time I speak anyway, uh, because really, you, if I was going to teach you all of the stuff about Jesus from the Adam and Eve story, then we'd be here for a good hour today. So we're going to try and keep it down to 20 minutes, and then we are gonna, um, we're going to move into a time of worship again, during which time, during that worship song, if you'd like to send us some questions uh, then, uh, or respond to what God is saying through these scriptures, then we would love to respond and help you to respond to God in a meaningful way. Um, so what is this all about? So number one, there's this moment, isn't it? It says that the Lord God... God was walking in the garden. And all of a sudden, I'm not sure whether you're aware of Scripture uh, in the same way that I am, but in my Bible, it says that Yahweh, as in the Father, um, doesn't have a body. He is all spirit. He doesn't have a body at all. And so in this moment, I'm going, oh, hang on a minute. Um, how can he be walking in the garden if he doesn't have feet, right? Um, and so I guess there's a few ways that we can look at this. So we're going to very quickly discuss the three ways that we can look at um, how, uh, how someone without a body could be walking in the garden, or um, maybe it's someone else other than the Father, um, which is probably where we're going to end up. Okay, Cause Remember, we're talking about Jesus in the Old Testament. So, um, so there are three things that we could, uh, we could attribute to this piece of Scripture here. Number one is that it could be that the writer is doing some anthropomorphism. Okay, anthropomorphism. And suddenly, um, I can see young Adrian going, what's that then? Um, so, <laughs> so anthropomorphism is essentially when we give um, human attributes to God. 
Okay, so this means that essentially if I say that God is selfish, then I am attributing a human, uh, a human sort of characteristic to God. That's anthropomorphism. Another thing that we can do is that we can essentially say that God has hands, okay? Now, the Bible doesn't say that Yahweh, uh, the Father, it doesn't say that he has hands, okay? So when we say God has hands, essentially what we're saying is um, we, we, we're attributing to him uh, something, uh, a human characteristic. So that's called anthropomorphism. So um, maybe um, what we see here is the writer of Genesis um, essentially um, giving an anthropomorphic sort of explanation about what he feels happened. Because you have to remember, sometimes scripture um, isn't dictated by God, but it's certainly inspired. So God says, I was in the garden with the boys or with boy and girl, Adam and Eve, and then the writer says, well, in that case, if he's in the garden, he must be like a human being, so in which case, he must have walked on his feet, and he attributes human characteristics to Yahweh, to the Father, um, and, and essentially tries to, um, tries to make it sort of almost known to the people that he's writing to about, um, about what might have happened, you know, or the second option is this, maybe, um, maybe he's talking about intimacy, you know, so sometimes um, when we talk about intimacy, we say that God was right next to us or he was so close that I could touch him. Now, it might not have been the case that God uh, had come that close, but it almost sometimes feels like, like, you know, I can almost touch him, like I can almost see him amongst us. He, he might not have necessarily been walking there in the physical, um, but I may have been so intimate with him in that moment that, it almost felt like he was literally walking with me through the garden as we were chatting and as I was sharing my life with him. I'm not sure whether you've ever been like that with maybe someone down the phone. Maybe um, uh, you ever had one of those moments where, um, you know, you get this feeling that, you know, oh, maybe I should speak to Laura. And then all of a sudden Laura rings and you're going, was that weird? Is that freaky? What's going on there? And, 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 and you, might, you, you might, as you're speaking to your loved one, you might, you might almost feel like they're there with you. And sometimes it might even feel like a couple of sentences that they say to you feel like a bit like a hug, you know. And so maybe the writer here is talking out of a place of intimacy with God. We were in the garden and we were cold and we were shivering and they were hurting and they were afraid. But because of the intimacy that they had with the Lord God, it felt like they were walking, that they were walking with him, literally like he had uh, started walking in the garden, even though Yahweh doesn't have flesh and doesn't have feet and doesn't have hands. But I was so intimate that it almost felt like I was walking alongside him and talking to him personally. At this point, I'd like to ask you, how's your intimacy with Jesus? Um, because you know, it's really important to ask the question, do I have a relationship with him? Um, how is my relationship with him? You know, what, um, what is our sort of connection? Do I pray every day? And if I do, then is it about me listing off a bunch of wants? Or is it about me spending time with him, getting to know more about him? And I think that sometimes in our sort of life of Christian-like being, Sometimes we can get into some habits and traditions that aren't particularly helpful and try to tick boxes rather than pursuing intimacy with him. And so I believe that in this moment, in right now, we can maybe look at um, how are we pursuing intimacy with Jesus? Because it seems like in this moment, Adam and Eve can literally, it's almost like can hear his actual voice or that they are literally walking with him. I had a friend called Jonathan once uh, who was a friend of Bar uh, Bible College. In fact, he still works in that area at the moment. And, uh, and Jonathan used to tell me about how he would walk through the grounds of our Bible College and he would speak to Jesus like he was right next to him, like he was walking with him because they were so close with one another. And I remember thinking, that's not really my style of intimacy. But then I'm like, well, what is my style of intimacy? Well, um, I guess... If I share with Jesus uh, the depths of my life and the depths of my feelings, then that's me being intimate with him. But it would have to be a two-way thing, wouldn't it, for us to have absolute intimacy with Jesus. So, so I guess the big question would be, um, how 
intimate are you with Jesus? What from his life and his thoughts does he share with you? I know, and suddenly you're going, well, actually, I don't think Jesus ever shared anything about his life with me. Did he not? Did he not share anything? It's interesting, isn't it? Did you give him time to share something? I can have a conversation with my wife when I'm in a different country, and we might have a 10-minute conversation on the phone. And we're intimate with each other, even though she's a far off. And even though I might be a little bit like, you know, um, I can't see you, I, I can only hear you. Um, but she might say something that helps me to remember what she looks like. And then she might share something with herself, uh, with me, about herself. And then I'd share something back, and we're being intimate from a distance. We can't see each other, but we're being intimate. How is your intimacy with Jesus today? Does he ever share with you? Do you ever give him time to share with you? What's the latest revelation that Jesus has given you? You know, what has he revealed about his heart? What has he revealed about heaven? What has he revealed about his life? Interestingly, I was reading some scripture this week, and, um, and I, was, I was just taken aback by this notion that Paul said, in his suffering, in his persecution, he learned what it was like to be like Jesus in his suffering and in his persecution. He shared in his suffering, it says. He shared in his suffering. And in doing so, he became more intimate with him. And all too often we pray, Lord, don't let us be persecuted. Lord, put a hedge of protection around us. Lord, would you stop persecution in other countries? But other countries and other people that are being persecuted are saying, but that's where I meet with him. In his pain, in his suffering, I get to know him more by enduring the same with him. And so today, I want to ask you again, how is your intimacy with Jesus? Number three, the third point about this Jesus walking in the garden, it could well have been literal, yeah? So um, when we read this, certainly I personally read this as a literal uh, sentence, a literal bit of scripture. So um, I see this as Jesus literally walking in the garden. And because Yahweh, the Father, doesn't have flesh, it means that he can't be walking in the garden, which means it must be that Jesus, the Lord God, was walking in the garden at the beginning of time. And so when we're looking into the, New Test into the Old Testament and we're looking at scripture to find Jesus in the Old Testament, suddenly we find this moment, this space, this time where at the very beginning of the book, the very first interactions with mankind, Jesus himself, the future sacrifice, is there then, is the king who is there then, at the same time as promising, as you'll see in a few moments, promising the kingdom to come. So the kingdom is there then, and the kingdom is still yet to come. He's not been born, but yet he's there in the flesh. Sometimes the paradigm of heaven can be a bit confusing and we misunderstand that. Sometimes, you know, we, we have to get our head outside of the time box, outside of the reality box, because reality in heaven is very different to reality now. And so Jesus can be here right now, but yet still be to come. And so essentially, I want to go on to the next bit of scripture in a few seconds. But before I get there, um, I just want to very quickly explain this kingdom now and kingdom to come thing because essentially what happens is in the timeline of earth um, there is a moment where Jesus is promised at the beginning of time right here in this scripture that we're about to read in a few moments Jesus is promised and then Jesus is promised promise 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 Jesus comes and then he as he comes he essentially makes a sacrifice on the cross and inaugurates the end of an old timeline okay um, or, or, or rather the beginning of a new timeline so um, so he inaugurates as he comes the first time 2,000 years ago. He inaugurates a new timeline. And then all of a sudden, we're in the old kingdom, the old ways of the world, and we're doing the old things of the world, i.e. creation is still broken. We're still broken. We're still hurting. But Jesus has come and led us into a place where the kingdom can come right now. But yet, even though the kingdom is here right now, and even though the king is with us right now, and even though we're able to walk in the kingdom, and we're able to talk in the kingdom, we're able to be in the kingdom, part participate in the kingdom fully, you can participate fully in the kingdom of God right now. 
is still to come. And when he comes again, it says that he will bring an end. Uh, he'll bring a full stop to history, essentially. And so the timeline of all of that promises, 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 Jesus comes and then it carries on. The broken world carries on until Jesus comes again. When he brings an end to history and then from there, the kingdom carries on. So we're living in a space between Jesus coming the first time, inaugurating the kingdom to come, and we're still waiting for him to come and bring an end to the time that is essentially history. So we're in this like the kingdom is here, the kingdom is still yet to come in all of its fullness and, uh, and healing and all that other stuff will happen when Jesus comes again in the future. And so we're in this space and Adam and Eve found themselves in that very same place. The king was walking in the garden with them. But as you'll see, as I read this little bit of scripture just now, um, God says to uh, Adam and Eve, he says, uh, because, so this is to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among the cattle, and more than every, and, uh, and more than every other beast of the field. On your belly you will go, the dust you will eat, all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your heel." And you shall bruise, oh, sorry, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So, um, so in this little bit of scripture, the word bruise there, um, I had a little look last night just to double check the meaning of this. Um, so essentially what we see here is the ver very first um, sort of uh, expl explanation of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Okay, So he is Jesus. He, the offspring of Eve's womb, uh, he is Jesus, okay? And essentially what we see here is Jesus is going to come and bruise, it says, in the NASB. But in the original Hebrew, uh, the, the idea here is, like a, is almost like a crushing. It's an overwhelming of a certain part of the body that may bring about a, a, a bruise. So it, the, the Hebrew word there is over, to overwhelm or to bruise. So it's almost like a crushing. And so in your NIV, if you're reading the NIV, you'll see that it says that he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel or crush or overwhelm his heel. And essentially, um, there's, there's two things happening right here. Number one is he's saying, you know, the relationship between snakes and humans, uh, you know, so, so essentially this is what snakes uh, do. They, they bite humans on the heel. But then there's this prophecy, he will crush your head. And so as we fast forward uh, to the time of Jesus, when Jesus is hanging on a cross, the Bible says that in this moment, it says that um, he was not defeated. He was, he was winning the battle. He was winning the battle for mankind. He was winning the battle of sin. He was, he was destroying the enemy as he hung on the cross. And the enemy thought that he had won. He would thought that he had uh, bruised him, that he had crushed him, that he had overwhelmed Jesus. But instead, what we see is Jesus overwhelming the enemy. As the Bible says, he went into the depths um, even into uh, Hades or the waiting place underneath the earth. Not into hell, mind you, because hell hasn't been opened yet. But he goes into the depths and he essentially um, releases the captives. And in doing so, he crushes the enemy's head and he literally takes the keys to life and death and he takes them back into his, um, into his domain and says that he's going to lead the people into a place of safety, of refuge, of, of peace, of joy. A place that we like to call heaven. And so uh, in this moment, in this moment in Genesis chapter 3, what we see is, firstly, we see Jesus, the Lord God, who, who is very much kingdom now and kingdom yet to come, uh, ministering to uh, the first two human beings as they walk in disobedience. He still loves them. He still wants to bring them to a place of repentance. And then he says, uh, with, one, with his very first promise, Jesus is still to come. He's going to come in the future and he's going to crush the enemy's head. He's going to crush the enemy's plans. He's going to crush the enemy's ideology. He's going to crush his worldview. He's going to crush everything about the enemy. He's going to bring about a new world, a new place of being, a new, uh, a new future, a new kingdom. And Jesus is inaugurating that kingdom right now. As we even speak right this second, Jesus is l taking us into an eternal life. So if today you're a believer in Jesus, then you've already entered into...
to eternal life. You, you, you don't enter into eternal life when you die and go to heaven. As soon as you believe, you enter into his kingdom. You enter into his domain. As soon as you believe on Jesus, as soon as you rest on him, as soon as you accept his salvation and his, and his like bringing you into his family, as soon as you accept that, you enter into his kingdom. Uh, that is the kingdom to come. And essentially, you start to live eternally from that moment. Everything that you do um, essentially starts to restore you. You start going from one degree of glory to the next. You start turning into uh, something that looks a bit more like Jesus because he is keen on helping you to look like him. Uh, He's keen to make you in his image and in his likeness, as we discussed last week. He wants you to live a life of fullness and not of poverty and not of pain. He wants you to live in heaven, in a heavenly realm. He wants you to be intimate with him and to, and essentially, you know, in this moment, as he as he sort of like goes to the cross and he and he gives up his life and the enemy thinks he's won but he's not. He's being crushed in that very moment. Jesus tears open the heavens and he says i'm going to come down like a floodgate i'm going to open the floodgates of heaven and heaven is now open for me and you to experience in the same way as adam and eve did uh, in genesis chapter 3 where we can walk together with jesus and and you know it might be that from time to time you feel so intimately close to him that it feels like he's literally walking with you it might also be that this is very literal and he may be there in the flesh with you. We'd love to hear any stories of times where you've seen Jesus in the flesh or where you've experienced him, uh, seen his presence, seen his glory, where you've, where, where you've experienced him in some way. But as a response today, I want to I lead you into a response of, hey, Jesus, um, I'm so glad that you've opened the door to me into life eternal. And today, I want to become more intimate with you. So maybe you'd like to pray with me and then we're going to head into another song. I'd love to see your responses. I'd love to hear what you've got to say. I'd love to hear your experiences of Jesus. But we're going to head into another song. And essentially, after this song, we're going to to come back. We'll be on a sofa, comfy sofa, answering questions and responding with you to what's been said. So let me ask you the question. Let me ask you a question. How intimate are you with Jesus right now? How intimate are you with Jesus right now? Is it about time you started to pursue intimacy again with him? Pray with me if this is your prayer. We're going to pray for that intimacy. Lord God, who walked in the garden, Jesus, God with flesh on. Jesus, we pray today as a body, as a group. We want to know you more. Help us, help us today to acknowledge that you're with us, to call out to you that you might share yourself with us in an intimate way. Help us to become more intimate with you today, that we might know and value your presence in a new and fresh way. Help us in our pursuit of intimacy. In Jesus' name, amen.
Send revival, God, and start with me. I really want to have intimacy with you today, God. I really want to be in that place. I really want to spend time with you in that way. So today, God, I pray that you'd help us to connect with you, help us to be real with you, help us to love you, 
tell me today what's going on in your heart and in your life. Hallelujah. Glory. So there's a few people that are commenting. So Harmony said, uh, hey, Harmony. Um, Harmony said, that's amazing. Um, I never realized that Genesis would even relate to Jesus at all. Uh, that's so life-changing. Even then, God was offering us a view to salvation that he had planned for us. How merciful and forgiving. Yeah, amen, amen. I'm going to talk some more about that next week as well. And um, it's worth mentioning that... Um, I think um, I read once that there was like over 500 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. I, I read about that before I became a Christian, actually. Um, I, was, I was sort of like seeking, you know, is Jesus the real deal? What's this all about? So I started searching for these promises, and uh, I, never really, I never really saw them. I started reading the Old Testament before I knew it. Um, I'd become a Christian before I'd even seen a prophecy about Jesus, not realizing that these moments in themselves are prophecies about Jesus. They're talking about him. Um, and so you, you'd never really know unless you knew what you were looking for. Um, and uh, obviously, we're going to go into so many more of those as well. Uh, and it's really, really interesting. Um, so yeah, Charles said, thank you, Jesus, for reigning sovereign, uh, sovereignly uh, for eternity to eternity, everlasting God. Amen. And uh, Rosa said, I know you are with me always. Love the conversations we have. I'm talking, I'm guessing she's talking to Jesus just here. Um, could you not do life, uh, could not do life without you? And the things that you've shown me, words cannot explain, only Jesus. Hallelujah, only you, Jesus. Come on. Hallelujah, um, indescribable. Go on. I was just thinking about what um, Harmony said. And that was my experience for a long time as well. So when I first became a Christian, um, I didn't realise there was, there was so much about Jesus in the Old Testament. And I definitely didn't know that there was uh, symbolically like a message from him right from the very beginning, right from Genesis, um, right in the story, just after the... Well, even in creation, when you were talking about last week, were you about um, the word? Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I was thinking that sort of struck me when you were talking about about the serpent or and we know that, that we kind of that symbolizes the enemy or the devil and how he thought he had won when Jesus died on the cross and how Jesus flips everything on its head and how that you know that the Jews were expecting the Messiah to arrive uh, with an army uh, on a horse and to to wipe out the occupiers you know and rescue them but he flipped everything on its head and he came as a as a baby and he he came on a donkey and uh you know he died on a cross and in dying he won victory for us which seems so backwards but but brilliant and yeah it's exciting yeah so um so let us know um if you're watching and um and uh let us know uh Oh, was Colin said, hello, Colin, my mate, how you doing? Um, <laughs> uh, let us know um, if, you're, um, if you're joining uh, today and uh, if you're um, able to, uh, if, if, if you'd like some prayer and stuff as well. So um, we're literally talking about Jesus and we're talking about how, uh, how he's mentioned in the Old Testament. And so um, you, you can imagine, um, you know, maybe you're feeling today like, wow, I didn't realize that Jesus was promised in the Old Testament. I didn't realize that was the case. Um, and maybe you're feeling like, hey, actually, Pastor, what you said about living eternally and what you said about living in God's kingdom even now, um, I, I sort of want to be part of that. You know, um, Maybe you're thinking, hey, I never knew this was the case. I never knew that you could have so much intimacy with Jesus. I mean, in fact, one of the things that Laura um, may not remember, she probably will remember this, but um, Laura's story of salvation when she came to Jesus, when she met him for the first time, was um, one of the things that she mentioned was, um, was that when she went to church, people around her had this relationship with Jesus. Are you for explaining that a little bit? Yeah, I think when I was younger... Um, as a kid, I'd grown up in Sunday school, I read my Bible, um, I went to a great church, um, and I felt like I knew the theory of God, so I knew about God, um, 
I'd read a lot about God, probably. I'd, I'd heard all the stories of the Old Testament that they do in Sunday school. I'd thought about Noah's Ark a lot and uh, well, Daniel and the Lions, then all of those great stories. Um, so I knew about him, but I didn't know him. And I think it was only when I came back to church, probably when I was about 18, and I, actually when I joined a life group with a group of other people. So the next, I was 18, bearing in mind, the next youngest person was in their late 50s, and most of the group were elderly ladies. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a bit weird. I don't know if I'm going to fit in with this group. Um, but they were fantastic. And the thing that I noticed about them as individuals, they talked about Jesus as if they knew him and they prayed as if he was in the room with us. And I think that was the first time I'd really noticed that about Christians. And I realized that that wasn't potentially what I had, that I knew lots about God and I still wanted to follow God and I wanted to um, do, do right by God. But I'd never had the experience of talking to him or knowing him personally. Um, and so that was a new revelation for me. That was different. Mm, lovely. Excellent. So, um, so I, I guess we could ask a question um, uh, f uh, from you guys just now that are watching. Um, do you know Jesus yourself? Like, do you have intimacy with him? Are you in a relationship with him? Or do you just know about him? And, um, and maybe there's some of you guys right now who are thinking, actually, I'm sort of jealous of what Darren and Laura are talking about right now. And, um, and I want a relationship with Jesus. Um, and so maybe just now, um, if that's you, um, that really starts with a prayer, okay? Um, but it doesn't end with a prayer. So notice I said it starts with a prayer. <laughs> um, so your life eternal starts with a prayer. Your relationship with God starts with a prayer. And then we carry on moving in that place, in that realm, in that um, in that relationship, okay? So um, in the same way as, like, I remember... Um, Hey, did, did I ask you out or did you ask me out? I think I asked you out, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> no audience I think I asked you out. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> and I a lucky never, boy. I'd never admit that later. Glory, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, so when Laura wanted to have a relationship with me, she approached me and asked, can we have a relationship? Um, and so today, if you're wanting a relationship with Jesus, Yahweh, the Father, Holy Spirit, you know, that whole Godhead thing that goes on that we don't quite understand. But we want to have a relationship with Jesus today. If you'd like to have a relationship with Jesus, then all we need to do is approach him and ask, Jesus, um, can we start a relationship today? Would you speak to me from time to time um, and help me to want to speak to you? So we can do that just now, like we can pray just now, um, and that'd be great. So let's let's do that, and then maybe you want to say the same prayer as me. You can follow me where you're at, and um, and pray the same prayer with me. You might want to close your eyes. I know that sort of makes people feel comfortable. Um, <laughs> um, and just say with me, Jesus, Lord God, who walked in the garden. I really want to have a relationship with you. Would you come into a relationship with me? Would you speak to me when I speak to you? And would you help me to connect with you in a meaningful way? Amen. Amen. And amen just means, yeah, I really want that. I want that for me as well. If you've said yes to that and you want some help with that, remember that's the start of the relationship. To continue the relationship, we can help you. So we can help you with like... Bible study techniques and helping you with uh, relating to God in that way. So if you'd like to be part of that, then please let us know um, like really quick. Don't wait. Let us know today. Um, I, I've chosen to have a relationship with Jesus and I've asked him into my life, uh, to come into my life. Um, if that's the case, then let us know and then uh, we'll add you. I'll personally add you as a friend. We can chat. We can have a coffee. We can talk about how this thing works and the depths of relationship that we can have with Jesus. Um, so I just want to move on from there. Um, Malcolm sent me a little message um, saying, Hi, mate. Nice preach. Thanks, Mal. Um <laughs> But there's always a that's, uh, but. Um, would question um, uh, the idea that we have immortality. Um, so... Um, in terms of um, in terms of immortality, um, it's, it's a very interesting concept. 
Um, so the Bible says that we uh, we will die the first time, and then our, and then we will be raised um, in the flesh into heaven, um, and that in heaven we will have uh, resurrected bodies, resurrection bodies. Okay. Um, so um, so. Do I keep this body as it is? I hope not, because I need to lose a few, a few pounds. Um, will it have the same tattoos on? I hope not, because some of them I'm not particularly proud of. Will I have the same scars? I hope not, because I'm almost perfect at the moment, and um, the scars let me down. Um, <laughs> um, however, however, Jesus in his resurrected body still had the hole in his hand and the gash in his side. And so I might suggest that some of these things will remain. However, um, I'm not entirely sure about that, but we do still die. The Bible says that in dying, we enter into life. Um, however, we do enter the kingdom now. So um, the, 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 essentially what I was trying to say there, Malcolm, and anyone else who's watching, um, was that, um, is that we enter into his kingdom and his kingdom is everlasting, it's eternal, it's, uh, it's, it's never ending. And so, uh, and so even though our, our flesh may die, our spirit carries on, and even after Jesus uh, like brings an end to the world after the, next, um, after the next sort of coming of Jesus, the Bible says he's going to come again and he's going to destroy everything and we'll get resurrection bodies. Um, uh, I think Harry might even be able to explain a bit more of that than I could. Cheers, Daz. Yeah. Um, just to respond to Jacob. So Jacob said, what tip would you give to help make it enjoyable to read the Bible? Because I never liked reading, but I want to read the Bible. Um, I think that is a question that a lot of people ask us. Are you right, Has? Dwell is it an app. Amazing. Okay, so Harry, Pastor Harry's just reminded us of an app called Dwell. Um, is it monthly subscription? It's £30 for a year. Can you pay it monthly or not? You just pay it. Okay, okay. So it's an app that costs £30, but that's for the whole year. And it, it reads the Bible to you. It's got music. It's got... Yeah. Wow. So Pastor Harry has been listening to the, to the whole Bible over in 90 days just using this app, which I'd say that is a lot of Bible, isn't it? So it's, yeah, and lots of us, like I couldn't do that reading, reading it physically. So there's the Dwell app. Um, there's probably, if you can't afford that, there might be some other free apps. I know there are some free Bible reading apps. Um, I personally find if I'm, when I'm reading the Bible, challenging myself with like a Bible in a year plan as well, just because I think I like to compete with myself to, to be... I don't usually finish it, I'll be honest, but I usually get to about July, August, and I'm really proud to, that I've got a good chunk done, and then I have to carry on after that. I'm currently reading the Gospels. Um, but, yeah, uh, if, if you in terms of actually reading, just, just reading small chunks as well, reading one chapter at a time, reading the Gospels maybe as a first port of call to really get to know Jesus and his heart. I wouldn't necessarily start right at the beginning of the Old Testament because I used to do that a lot when I, in my teens when I'd be like, right, I'm going to start and I'd get to Leviticus where it's all about lots of different, really, ra some of them random laws and I'd just really struggle with it. Or Numbers where there's just about four chapters of names yeah. and relationships. So, so, yeah, so start with the Gospels, get the Dwell app if you can afford it. Um, read in small chunks if you are reading um, and and yeah just challenge yourself even setting a reminder thinking about the things that might get in the way as well so I know for me it's been really helpful to think in my day what's going to get in the way of me reading the bible well it's this and this and this so what can I do to bypass that so I set an alarm on my phone as well which sometimes I acknowledge and sometimes I click off to my shame <laughs> but yeah there's lots of things we can do so what inspires me to read scripture is when, um, is when I learn something that I've just never learned before. Um, and it's opened up in such a way that I go, man, how did I miss that? You know, or, or I didn't know this was so deep, you know. 
uh, and 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 lots of other, you know, can you imagine? You know, you're just reading it, and then if you read it on face value, oftentimes you're just like you know, just reading it, and, and that's great. You know, God will speak to you through that. But um, I've probably read scripture maybe three or four times doing that, and and I'll keep on reading it nonetheless. You know, so I keep on going into that. Um, but then every now and again, um, you know, when I see something, a piece of information, I'm like, oh wow, uh, you know, I I how how was that ever so deep? I don't know, um, you know, and and that inspires me to read more. The other thing that inspires me to keep on reading and to and to read more scripture is by putting that scripture into practice. Um, so when I see uh, scripture says that I, uh, I should rebuke an older man gently, um, then essentially what that means is I then, I then stop being so harsh towards an older person, or I speak to them more gently, I'm more, uh, I'm more respectful, and then uh, honorable, yeah, and so my relationships then become better. And then when I see the benefits of reading my scripture, when I put it into practice, it makes me want to read it more because my life becomes more peaceful. My relationships become better, deeper, more intimate. Um, my, my worldview starts to change. My life starts to change in such a way that I, I start thinking, man, I want to read this thing more and more and more. Um, did you want to say anything else? No. no. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, is it, uh, I saw you give Harry a thumbs up. Oh, he's put the Dwell app on the uh, on the uh, comments just there for everyone to download if you'd like to. Um, lovely jubbly. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions and there's none on YouTube either, um, then I'm totally cool with um, maybe praying again and, and finishing with a final song uh, to worship as we as we go out today. So um, so let me pray once more. Um, to the Jesus who, for me right now, is in the room. And I want to pray that he will come and be with you in your room as well. Lord, I thank you today that we get to spend time with you. I'm so pleased to be your follower. I'm so pleased to be in a relationship with you. I love really intimate moments, and I love it when you teach me stuff about Scripture that I never knew. Sometimes you teach me things that no one's ever seen before. I love it when you work in my life. I love it when you help me to be a better dad, a better husband. I love it when you help me to be a better worker and a harder worker. I love it when you help me just to be the best me that I can be. And today, I pray the same for my friends, my family, my congregation, my loved ones who are watching right now. Amen.